Hi everyone, we're live today from the Sydney Hangout office. Um, we have here today Tor to my left, who's the product manager for Google Maps API. Uh, and joining us through Google Plus Hangouts, Mano Marks, uh, developer advocate for Google Maps API. Um, so today, uh, the topic of our conversation will be the V2 to V3 transition. Um, so we've got, it's great that we have Tor here to talk about uh, some of the history of V2 and what it means uh, for V3 going forward. Uh, so uh, first of all, Tor, what does it mean to be a product manager? Um, yes, tell us a little about yourself, Tor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, at Google, a product manager essentially is someone who um, owns the strategy and roadmap and, and overall success of a product. Um, so uh, there are, are normally around one product manager for every um, 10 to 15 engineers that you have working on a product. Um, and uh, the job of a product manager, uh, a variety of things, but in large part it's a sort of shield the engineering team from all the other issues that have to be resolved in, in order to um, manage the launches of a product and the life cycle of a product. Um, so you know, on a day-to-day -day basis I could be talking to the legal team or the marketing team or reviewing documentation or doing roadmap planning or you know, all manner of things, speaking at conferences, etc. So um, yeah, a wide variety of stuff. Cool. And so how long have you been product manager, manager for Google Maps API? Um, I for Google Maps API, I think two and a half years now. So this will be my, yes, my third Google I.O. coming up cool. as product manager. Um, so you mentioned uh, product managers sort of develop the strategy for the product. Mm -hmm. um, what's the strategy for the Google Maps API? Well, I think that for the last, uh, uh, you mentioned the sort of the V2 to V3 transition. For the last couple of years, a lot of the, the roadmap uh, and the features that we've been developing have been driven by the need to, to provide the solutions that people need in order to move from V2 to V3. So that has been a, a, a theme that sort of run underneath a lot of what we're doing. We obviously want um, developers who are coming from V2 um, to feel comfortable that V3 can offer them what they need um, for their applications. Um, at the same time, we, we do try and um, take a, a broader perspective on what the, uh, the role of the Maps API is and why um, what is this product for at its very, you know, a very basic level? Because um, back in the, in, uh, the V2 uh, timeframe, uh, the Maps API had a lot in common at a, at, a, at a technical level with Google Maps, the website. And as a consequence, um, you tended to see that uh, features would launch in Google Maps and then they would trickle down into the API. And we would just naturally let that flow happen and see you know, how developers responded to those features. Um, but I think it's important that we uh, keep in mind that there is a, actually a fairly important distinction between the purpose of Google Maps, which is about letting people find, you know, find directions, get to places, find, you know, search for businesses and so forth, and, uh, and the Maps API, which is really much more about developers, developers' data. Um, you know, we are really just uh, a, a platform for data visualization that allows you, the developer, to put your information in a geographical context. And so um, we have a, a responsibility to provide developers with um, the tools they need to better present their data, to tell their stories. Um, and so I think, especially now that we have sort of wrapped up the migration uh, from, from V2 to V3 in terms of ensuring that the, the features that from V2 that we feel it's important to have in V3 are there, that we're going to much more, um, just to concentrate much more on, on enabling oh. this kind of uh, broader data visualization use cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the use cases are quite different from what our developers do and what's on maps. Um, for example, G Google Maps doesn't ever show more than, say, 10 markers at a time because that's what comes back in a, a search response, um, whereas our developers you know, regularly add thousands or tens of thousands of markers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting also that uh, um, I, I would say that in the early days of the Maps API, a lot of what developers wanted to do with the Maps API was informed by what they saw us doing on Google Maps. So they would see a feature on Google Maps or, and they would want to be able to bring that into their own mapping applications. What we're increasingly seeing now is developers who um, have a much clearer sense of the kinds of, of applications they would like to build um, independently and bring to us features that we don't have on Google Maps that they would like to see in the Maps API. And we started to see things flowing back the other way as well. We started to see Google projects and properties adopting um, services and, and features of the Maps API that we've built for developers. So, so that there's a 
Google moderator question that says um, from Nyamwei saying, just saw Manomark's new blog, go v3, it's time to upgrade. So when will maps.google.com migrate? Why is it not after two years? For us, it's less reliable for support of non Mercator map types in v3, and Flash based Street View looks much better. So uh, it, it's an interesting question. As, as I mentioned back in the um, uh, back in the V2 days, there was a lot more commonality between um, the Maps API and the Maps application. Um, one of the reasons why this changed was because uh, the because the Maps API is generally used on uh, third-party websites. And those third-party websites could be accessed on the web browsers on a wide variety of devices, and we cannot in a sense, constrain the types of devices people use to browse the web. And so we need to make sure that the Maps API um, works well across the full spectrum of devices across its full feature set. If you look at Google Maps, they're in a slightly different position. Um, the, uh, a lot of the, the, the bulk of the mobile traffic, for example, um, for Google Maps as a service comes from native applications on, on mobile devices rather than from loading a web-based version of Google Maps. And that allows them to make technology decisions that differ between the web and, uh, and mobile devices. So Street View is a great example. Uh, Street View you know, on, uh, in um, Google Maps for many years was, was exclusively Flash-based. Um, and that works, you know, that works well on, uh, on desktop, uh, but not so well on mobile devices. But that wasn't an issue because the no mobile devices had their own native Street View implementation. Um, you'll see that, uh, that in Maps GL, of course, Street View is no longer Flash-based. Um, it's now WebGL based um, and, and part of a, uh, a broader 3D experience. And I would expect that um, you know, we, as, uh, as the adoption of WebGL and the, uh, the number of browsers that support WebGL um, uh, improves, you know, you'll see some of those same improvements coming down into the Maps API. I, I don't currently expect uh, that Maps.google.com itself will switch to um, uh, to use the Maps API. I think we've made a, a very clear decision that it's important for Google Maps to be able to rapidly iterate on features um, and and also have the freedom to add or remove features and take different technology approaches across different browsers, um, which means that its uh, requirements in terms of, of underlying infrastructure. Um, are somewhat inconsistent with our needs as not just a developed product, but also a paid developed product. So we have you know, a, a successful enterprise business selling uh, licensing for the Google Maps API. And uh, you know, developers generally, and, and particularly some of those large commercial developers, they have very, very high expectations on consistency and stability um, and, and uh, visibility into the roadmap and so forth. And there's a, a, something of a conflict there between the very sort of fast moving, agile, Google development model for our own products and some of the expectations of enterprise customers. So it's likely that Google Maps will remain an independent code base, I think, for the foreseeable future. I guess there's also uh, the matter of customizing maps for mm -hmm. particular users, um, which isn't possible with the API because we serve cookie-less, so we have no idea about um, which Google account is logged in, so there's practical yes. differences as well. So uh, there is, that's actually um, very important to some of our, some of our customers, is we have, uh, there are certain, um, uh, government regulations particularly uh, around a specific class of sites which means that they must not set cookies um, and uh, and so we have re-architected the API to be totally independent of cookies and sessions in any way um, which obviously is good in some respects it's also uh, also helps uh, has a side effect that it helps with performance um, because for particularly for mobile devices on lower bandwidth networks um, cookies can add fairly significantly to the payload for some of the, the, the more lighter weight requests we do, such as for geoconium and so forth. Um, so it's actually a positive thing in that respect, but it does sort of cut us off from uh, some of the user, uh, user specific, you know, end user authenticated um, features that Google Maps has the freedom to implement. Mm. Hey Tor, yep. can you uh, tell, uh, can you just tell us what's the feature that's most excited you in the last year about the Maps API, the feature we've been able to release? Um, oh, that's a great question. So, I think um, I'm going to cheat slightly and broaden and <laughs> broaden the question to the last few years, like the, the time that I've been managing the product. Um, there are a couple of features that I I really love. Um, I think one which I I often mention, which which I realise isn't necessarily uh, as as broadly um, uh, uh, valuable as, as others, is elevation. I'm I. 
my the, the extent to which I like a feature is is often a function of how much time I spend playing with the demos we write for it. Um, and I found uh, I, I found Elevation just fascinating um, when we implemented it. Just being able to experiment with um, with the sort of the elevation profiles across um, different routes. Ooh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there you go. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and also being able to look at the difference between, for example, driving routes and walking routes across the same uh, city and things like that. Um, and the fact that it does underwater um, depth as well was, was a lot, uh, really interesting. Um, so, so I'm a big fan of that, that feature. And people have done some really interesting things with it that we didn't expect, such as figuring out the, um, uh, the, likely, uh, the locations they need to put mobile phone masks based on um, you know, signal dissipation over over cities based on the elevation and so forth. Um, another feature that I'm, as some of you, if anybody, any of you follow uh, our blog, will know a huge fan of is autocomplete. Um, so uh, autocomplete, if you're not aware of it, is a feature that uh, you can attach to a text field um, on any web page that will give that text field the ability to predict places uh, as users uh, enter addresses um, or, or business names and uh, that um, uh, there are various controls there in terms of you can control that control whether we just return addresses or just return businesses or only return city names or only return results in specific countries. Um, essentially, every single field text field on the internet which asks you to enter an address in any form needs this feature. Right? Without it, um, you know I can only assume you hate your users. So. <laughs> um, uh, and and the thing is, once you've seen that feature and you understand what it can do. Every time you come across a text field that doesn't use it, it drives you crazy. Um, so I'm on a, a, a crusade to have this feature rolled out everywhere because it, it just it's one of the, the little details that just makes the web better for everybody. Hey Tom, welcome to the Hangout. Have you, uh, have you got any questions for Tom? Thanks, man. Or any of us? No, no, I just thought I'd uh, come in and listen to what uh, you guys were talking about. Cool. Yeah. I was so just you, saying... You, we use Tom the is, uh, comes with a GoCatch, which is a free taxi application in, uh, I guess, in Australia, right? Yeah, yeah Australia, actually globally, but um, yeah, mostly in Australia. We've got a couple of other centres like Singapore and, and Croatia, which, uh, but yeah, mostly mostly <laughs> Australia. <laughs> so all the contiguous places that you can find, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just saying we use the uh, we use autocomplete for um, uh, where, when the user has to type in a suburb for their destination, and yeah, it's great. Uh, really, really improves the usability. So, yeah, uh, cool. that's cool. So, are you guys? So, you guys must be using V3 then. Uh, this is so we're just that's just the um, uh, the the API, just the autocomplete API in um, oh, the web service places. Yeah, the web yeah. service. Yeah. Um, so it, this, we use MapKit in the iOS app and yeah, MapView in Android. So, cool. Yeah, so we, we, we do use uh, V3 on the website though. Yeah. I noticed you have a Windows 7 app. What are you using uh, for that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's Bing Maps, um, which sort of <laughs> you kind of have to use. So um, yeah, I, I've done a little, stuff, little bit of stuff with Bing Maps on the web as well and yeah, it doesn't really compare. Which you'd expect, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, given given the maturity of Google Maps, and yeah. uh, I mean, it's it's my favorite API of all of the Google APIs. Yeah, I think it was was yeah. Google Maps the first API that we released, or one of the that, first. That's a, a no, contentious was point. A, I think the there soap, was a there was a soap search API that may have preceded us. Right. Remember soap? Yeah. <laughs> I do. Definitely preceded <laughs> us. It was being deprecated by the time we came around. But yeah, it was um, it was still pretty popular uh, with a small number of developers when I started in 2006. Yeah, I think I, I started working on the Maps API in 2006, working with the Maps API rather. <laughs> yeah. Shall we uh, grab another moderator question? Yeah, sure. Um, so what you were talking about before sort of leads into this one. Uh, actually, sort of two. Let's do them together. Uh, so one more thing, how is Maps GL, uh, how does that fit into G Google's Geo API offering in the future? Um, and I sort of that, that sort of leads into uh, 
uh, Google had a press event on June 5th and released new features on Google Maps, 3D, offline, etc. When will those feature come to any flavor of the API, if ever? Okay, so um, the, the features that were announced at the press event on June 5th, I believe the 3D maps were, um, uh, were, were demoed on uh, tablet, I believe, for, as part of Google Earth. Um, so uh, that's actually kind of quite independent right now of, um, of Google Maps, both the desktop product and, and the API. Um, and similarly, offline, I think, was part of the Android app too. Um, these are actually, uh, offline in particular is something that does come up fairly frequently as a, an ask for the, for the Maps API. And it's something that uh, I think we're keeping a close eye on the various technologies that we could use to facilitate that. Um, there are some, uh, some security issues in terms of um, uh, how we uh, manage storage of the data in such a way that it's not um, easily kind of exportable, bulk exportable, that we would need to address. So, so it's not uh, unfortunately that simple, but it's something that there is definitely a lot of demand for. So I hope that we can address that in future. Um, the the 3D um, maps, essentially the the, uh, the te technology that was demoed on June 5th um, takes the 3D environment that you have in Earth and sort of steps it up a level in terms of the quality of the um, the building renderings, the amount of detail. Um, it's a uh, it's a really beautiful thing to behold when you see it. Um, and uh, that's being rolled out in, in Earth initially um, for for tablets, and then I believe um, you know I, my expectation will be that it will it will flow through to other products um, over time. And, and you know at some point I hope that we can be one of those products, but I think it's a little bit of a way off yet. Um, as far as the other question was Maps GL, so Maps GL is something that we again have been you know obviously watching closely, and we're in close contact with that team, um, and we've sort of talked about. Uh, when we would want to um, start working on on bringing MapsGL into the API, um, there are some again some challenges that are somewhat peculiar to the API here. Um, one of the big difficulties that we've had is um, is evaluating the devices on which we can reliably use MapsGL and ensure that performance is um, is what it needs to be and that it is stable and reliable enough. Um, and we actually uh, did some experiments with MapsGL in the v in the V3 um, Street View player about a year ago, and we did run into some problems with um, with browsers at that time. Um, the way that MapsGL.com addresses this is they run a, a performance test within your browser when you click the Enable MapsGL button, and it takes a few seconds to run. And, uh, and once it's completed, they decide one way or the other whether you're a MapsGL capable browser. And if you are, they store a cookie that allows them to. Um, load Maps GL from that point onwards. And now, as we mentioned, the Maps API is cookieless, which means that we are not in a position to, to do that as easily, and we would have to run that that detection right now while there is still this broad uh, range of, of performance and device support, and graphics card issues, and so forth. We would have to run that every time, um, which would seriously impact the the user experience. Um, so we have to. Um, I think you know what, what we're really looking to do is wait for s sort of adoption of of, Maps, of WebGL as a technology within browsers to really get um, a little bit more um, ubiquitous, and before we feel like not only can we reliably use MapsGL in a way that won't undermine user experience, but also that we can offer features um, that the MapsGL enables, um, which developers would feel comfortable using, knowing that their user base is likely to be able to take the benefit of that. I guess that goes back to the differences in use cases between maps.google.com and our API sites. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our sites just want to serve <laughs> maps really quickly, um, and if they have that lag before they can do that, that's sort of really detrimental yeah. to them. I think, uh, I think it's it, also very important. The that things we... that I, I get really excited about, though, is um, Maps GL and the uh, GMM, the Google Maps uh, for mobile and Android, and take advantage of vector-based rendering, which I think is, I'm, we haven't really mentioned that here, but I think it's, a, it's one of the really exciting uh, new technologies that we're doing, not just serving out map tiles, but actually serving out data and then letting the, um, the applications render it in, uh, in their clients. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, that is going to open up a tremendous amount of capabilities once, um, once browsers are, are capable of doing it. And, and we're already seeing that um, on the native apps on, on Android. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, does that tie into 
our strategy, do you think? Do you think 3D is the future? Um, I think that it's important that we um, focus on what I was saying earlier about what is the Maps API for. Um, I mean, it seems like a, a, a simple and obvious question, but um, it's very easy to get swept up in new features that come from Google Maps and just assume that we have to put them in the API as quickly as possible because people will expect to see them there because they've seen them on Google Maps and not stop and think about what is the utility of this feature to developers? What does it enable them to do that they couldn't do before? How do we ensure that this feature will um, expand the, um, the potential of the API to offer uh, developers the opportunity to tell new stories, to visualize data in more interesting ways, to, um, to convey information in, in, in a way that, uh, is, um, uh, that achieves more uh, for them or that, that uh, um, engages more with their users. And I think that with MapsGL, you know, that's, that's a very important consideration. We should not add MapsGL into the Maps API just because, in quotes, 3D is cool. Um, because you know, th although, although 3D is very visually attractive, um, just a 3D implementation in and of itself, you tend to find that people will um, you know, navigate to their home and check it out and, and fly around a bit. But um, actually making sure that that feature uh, can be applied to the presentation of, of information in addition to, to, to just the imagery that we provide, I think is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think Mano is right that, that, in a sense, without meaning to play down the importance of 3D, um, which I do agree is, is, is an important part of the future uh, and we have a responsibility to, to make it accessible and make it easy to use and not too disorienting, which is another issue that 3D has for users sometimes. But I think that um, in terms of just the, the, the near-term impact on the ability of the API to offer developers interesting new visualization capabilities, vectors have a lot of, uh, a lot of promise there that, uh, that, that I think is, is the first thing that we need to tackle. Yeah. We can do so uh, like Tom is actually order. asking a question. Um, Tom, do you want to just ask it? It's, you, I know you typed it into the chat. but Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, so just talking about 3D and, and delivering vector data to the client. Um, I'm wondering whether there are any plans or if you guys can talk about uh, any plans to integrate sort of a turn-by-turn -turn mode in the Android map view or indeed any, any, anything you can tell us about uh, any plans to refresh the, the Android map view. Um, so um, just one thing I, I'll note, I think currently uh, navigation on Android devices can be launched through an intent on Android. Yeah. That's my understanding. Um, yeah. But yeah, the rest of your, your question still stands. I'll let that tour address that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not something that I'm personally involved in directly. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not really qualified to comment in, in detail. Um, I... I suspect that, so I, I think there, there are two kind of, e even on Android, the, the applications that we have, the, the sort of the vector-based rendering of the map is, is quite a distinct implementation from the turn-by-turn the -turn navigation. Turn-by-turn um, -turn navigation itself is a very complex area contractually in terms of um, uh, the rights that, that, that uh, we can offer um, third parties to offer turn-by-turn -turn navigation. So. Um, my expectation is that that is not something that we would be tackling um, in the immediate future. Um, I think that it's, in a sense, uh, clearly there is, there is some utility to having an API around that. But I think that, coming back to what I said earlier about a MapsGL, tackling the general vector rendering um, within Android would probably have a broader utility initially. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I can't comment right now on on the, the sort of the plans the Android team might have because the the Maps API is you know currently for Android is part of the the Android SDK. Um, yep. But I you know I have to assume that it's something that uh, that they are um, conscious of and and you know I would imagine working on. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I guess I'm um, just bringing the um, the map view in line with the just the maps application on Android because the Maps application on Android is quite slick whereas, yeah. whereas MapView is sort of, uh, it's getting a bit tired, uh, it's still tile based and uh, the yeah. API itself has got some problems. So yeah, it um, be interesting to see uh, what's coming up with that. Yeah, I, I mean I've certainly heard you know, some concerns from developers about kind of the way that that API is structured. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I actually think that, um, uh, again, you know, it, it, it's important that we ensure that 
uh, any changes we make to our APIs, our maps APIs generally, you know, such as a switch from, from tar-based to, to vector-based rendering, that we bring more to the table than just a different way of showing the same map. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and also I think we should be conscious of the fact that, that sort of those of us who are close, very close to this technology, be it within Google or be it developers externally, are very conscious of these distinctions between, you know, uh, raster maps and vector maps, for example. Um, but end users are much, much less conscious of that than perhaps we realize. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure, again, that we do something that really um, is compelling for the end user, not just for, you know, for ourselves, if you like. Yeah, I guess that's sort of similar to the V2 to V3 transition. I mean, on the sur surface of it, it's sort of just another way of showing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, obviously, there's different design principles around V3 yep. and some advantages. What you know, what sticks out for you? Well, um, actually, uh, sorry, somebody actually commented on one of our uh, our posts earlier that he, he smelled V4 coming. So I, <laughs> I, I thought I'd get you to comment on that uh, uh, publicly. Well, I think that uh, given you know, given the amount of uh, time we have invested in getting v3 um, to the point where uh, any v2 application can move to v3 comfortably um, that's really not a process i'd like to kick off again so <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean it, it is very refreshing from a from a product management perspective to be at the point now where we really can take a much more open-minded view of um, where we can take this product and what we can do with it um, and and really think about what are the sort of new and innovative things we can do that will step up the capabilities of the product um, without having to worry so much about, well, um, we really need to make sure that this constituency of developers from the V2, um, on the V2 side are, you know, are, are also accommodated over here. But having been said, you know, as we've been working through the v V3's development, we've very consciously tried to not just bring features over from V2, but in doing so, also augment them and improve them and factor in feedback that we had um, from V2 developers at the time. So. Um, a good example of this is the drawing tools that we announced last year. Uh, Maps API V2 did have the ability to edit polylines and draw new polylines. When we brought it into V3, um, we added the toolbox so there was actually a UI component that you could use for switching in and out of these various modes. Um, v V3 also has uh, explicit support for circles and rectangles, so we made sure the drawing tools would integrate cleanly there. Um, and uh, I think you know we have pl we have huge plans as well to flesh those drawing tools out more and give you more flexibility over the way that things are rendered and uh, um, and and can be edited. So um, I think that uh, there's been a lot of sort of um, a, a lot of benefits that have come with the V2 to V3 transition in terms of the uh, the capabilities of the features that we brought across. It's not as if we've just been copying them over as is, um, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm keen that we can start. Uh, work on some uh, high, sort of newer features that perhaps haven't been seen before and have um, broad applicability. One of the issues that we faced with the V2 to V3 transition is where do we draw the line between features that um, that are uh, were sufficiently popular in V2 that we should bring them into V3, and those that perhaps were not that popular in V2 and, and bring them into V3 would require a certain amount of, of engineering effort plus ongoing maintenance. Um, but obviously, if we don't bring them over, we disappoint some developers. And so figuring out where to draw that line was, was kind of challenging. But it did mean that towards the end of the process, we were doing a lot of work on relatively, um, uh, I wouldn't say niche, but certainly features that had a, we were conscious had a smaller, a smaller audience than some of the, the other things that we have. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's very important that we, we think about broadly accessible and broadly valuable features that we can now bring. Um, this is also, incidentally, a reason why we spent quite a lot of time last year in particular working on um, very, perhaps subtle, um, ways in which we could finesse the product to make it better for everybody. So, for example, if you load a Maps API v3 map on a mobile device that has a high resolution screen, such as um, a Galaxy Nexus or an iPhone 4, and we automatically now switch into double resolution tiles so that the imagery remains extremely crisp. This will also benefit us you know, with the new MacBook Pro, for example. Um, we did work on it in, on smoothing the transitions, particularly in and out of obliques. Um, you know, a, a lot of little um, fine details that we felt just made the, the product um, a better experience and which everybody benefited from um, automatically. 
I guess going back to design principles, that's something that I've seen a lot in V3, is that we add these improvements and everyone gets them straight away um, because we automatically upgrade the API. Mm -hmm. Whereas in V2, these improvements were often hidden behind flags that defaulted to false. Yeah. Um, so that's a big difference in V3. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you know, one of the, the, the more significant changes we made very early on in the V3 development process was deciding that um, we would default to providing you with an experience as close to that of Google Maps as we could yeah. and then allow you to tailor it from there. Um, whereas in V2, you really had to build that up from you know, yourself. You had to add each control, you had to determine what the zoom behavior was on, on the scroll wheel zoom and, um, and various other things that uh, we noticed that you know, the vast majority of sites were just re-implementing the same code over and over and over yeah. again. Uh, and we really wanted to make sure that, um, you know, that particularly if we launch a new feature that we do believe is broadly useful, um, that developers have to do a minimal amount of work to benefit from that. Mm. Um, because it, it obviously is frustrating to us if we invest a lot of time in something that we think uh, has a lot of potential, um, but then we cannot get enough awareness of that feature out there for it to really get broad adoption. And, and V3 has done a much better job of bringing new features um, you know, to developers easily, I think. I think on the V4 uh, topic as well, um, and the way that I've seen V3 designed, mm -hmm. it's designed in such a way that it's easy to add new features without, um, you know, and keeping a consistent interface and yeah. um, sort of comprehensive developer experience. Yeah. Um, this is something we've been, we've been, we were very, very conscious of, was that, uh, I mean, we haven't talked, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, some of the, the motivations behind V2 in terms of the need for broader device support, sorry, for V3 in terms of broader device support. But another motivation was um, our increasing awareness that we had a lot of things we wanted to do with the API, a lot of new features we wanted to bring, but every new feature we, bring, we brought to the API uh, only, only increased its size, only increased the overheads associated with using it. So um, something we, we worked very hard on in V3 was a very deeply modular structure right through the product that allows us to load features on demand um, without the developers needing to be conscious of them of that. And we then layered on top of that um, later on, about a year or two into, the, into uh, V3, we layered a, a, on top of that an, an explicit libraries model where there are uh, larger scale features um, the developers can actually explicitly opt into them. And, uh, and that's proved to be, to be very, very um, valuable, um, and I think it's something that you'll see us continue to exploit to ensure that the core of the product remains very lightweight, um, and uh, and yet we can expand the capabilities easily. It's actually a really nice example of a large JavaScript code base. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever see us open sourcing um, some or some of the API or all, all of it? Um, I think that it's not something that's on on the roadmap right now. I think that um, it's something that we could. It's not inconceivable. I think that in the in the past, um, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we faced is that um, uh, the uh, Google in general you know, sources mapping data from a very wide variety of, of places, and uh, for for a long time, you know, we had relationships with a couple of large um, data providers um, for map data. Obviously, ma many of these relationships all over the world, and also for for local for business listings data as well. That's another, um, we have an even bigger set of, of partners and data providers there. Um, and uh, you know, we were sort of, obviously a, a lot of these partners that we work with, they have certain concerns and sensitivities about um, exposing the, the data that they offer and, and that they've built their business on offering um, through a product that is you know, freely accessible globally. Um, and we had a, an obligation to them in terms of maintaining a, a relationship with them and, and having continued access to that data, which we thought was very important to have the coverage and the quality that, that we're known for, um, that we, uh, we had an obligation to them to put some protections in place to ensure that um, you know, their data was used only in the manner in which you know, they expected it to be used and that we in intended it to be used, uh, wasn't available for bulk download or aggregation or so forth. And some of that, uh, those protections are built into the JavaScript themselves. Um, uh, and uh, it would be very, very difficult for us to maintain that degree of protection around that data. Um, if we open source. Yeah. Um, however, um, you know, uh, uh, as uh, for, for any of you who, who may have been at uh, the WHERE conference this year, um, Brian McClendon, who's the VP of, of Maps and, and Earth at Google, um, talked about how we have been, um, over the last few years, working 
to um, build up a, a broader corpus of data that we uh, have actually collected ourselves or for which we have full rights. Um, and, uh, and as that, that continues to happen and the corpus of data that we um, have expands, um, I expect that those kinds of sensitivities will begin to relax and then we can consider looking into options like open source. Uh, should we take one more from the moderator? Let's, uh, so currently the Google Earth API only works for desktop web browsers. How will we develop dynamic Earth apps for mobile? Will there be a separate API or will we be able to reuse the existing JavaScript libraries, perhaps using Gwit Earth? I think, uh, I think what you're, you're going to see, and uh, MapsGL is, is sort of the, the tip of this iceberg, is that this sort of long-standing separation that has existed between Maps and Earth will um, increasingly blur. Um, that, that currently they're, they're sort of treated as two distinct brands. Earth is the 3D globe. You know, Maps is the 2D Mercator projected flat map. Um, and as browser technology improves, um, that the need for that distinction will, I think, um, decrease over time. Um, and I think that it's actually quite important that from a user perspective, uh, we don't need to expose that split to users and we shouldn't have to expose that split to users. It should be easy for them to seamlessly flip from a 2D to a 3D environment you know, as they wish. Um, so um, I, I'm, uh, I don't actually uh, manage the Earth API. Um, that's part of the Earth, uh, Earth desktop product. Um, but my expectation would be that over time, um, you'll see more and more 3D features coming up in the Maps APIs um, and a lot of the Earth imagery, um, obviously we already have satellite view, we already have oblique view in the Maps API, but some of the sort of the, the technology that we demonstrated on, on June 5th, yeah. flowing down through into the mapping products and making this distinction unnecessary, um, which means that um, the kind of applications that you can build using the Earth API right now will be um, uh, equally possible to build using the Maps API in the future. That would be my, my hope. I guess we've started so, to see that trend already. The press event was a, a Google Maps event as opposed to a Google yeah. Earth event. Yeah. Um, but still had Google Earth. Just to know for developers cur developing currently, uh, you can launch Google Earth from an intent on Android. So you can uh, send a KML file to Google Earth and, and then have it be rendered within uh, Google Earth on your, uh, on your Android device. So I think that's an important uh, uh, step. And you know, with uh, network links, you can do a, f a, a certain amount of dynamic uh, interactions as well. Um, also, you can load in uh, Google Maps Engine layers into uh, Google Earth on the, on the Android devices, which I think is another uh, an important uh, distinction. And those can be reused on the desktop browser as well, right? That's right. Yeah. It can be used in Maps API applications, Earth API applications, and desktop Google Earth, as well as uh, WMS servers. Anyway, all, all, all mess of things you can do with it. <laughs> Um, okay, so for USA, it's possible to search street intersections with queries like ampersand. Will it be available for other countries in the near future? Okay, um, so the, the, the short answer to this question is, it, from me is, is, I'm afraid, is I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, the reason for that is that uh, the, um, you know, the geocoding capabilities of the Maps API are not something that we manage separately or maintain or develop separately. They're something that we, we share common infrastructure with Google Maps. And uh, uh, there is actually a team of engineers in Zurich, in Switzerland, who, who manage our geocoding infrastructure. Um, and uh, uh, they obviously have a, a team of engineers there and, and a product management team there who, um, who own that roadmap and, uh, and prioritize features. And I, I don't have a sufficient visibility into their roadmap to, to, to answer that question exactly. What I would say is that um, the, the goal of the geocoder essentially is to answer, um, answer the queries that users um, conventionally enter, if, if you like. Um, Addresses. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. So, so any, any format which um, in, uh, uh, is kind of the cultural norm for, for verbalizing or documenting an address in any given country is a format that we want to support. And the concepts of cross streets is, uh, you know, is, is pretty important in the US, um, particularly where you have your sort of grid-like, uh, you know, fairly common grid-like city layout. Um, as you probably uh, may, have, may have gathered, I'm originally from the UK, and, and cross streets are simply not a 
a common concept in the UK. Uh, and this is partly because the road network there is a crazy mess um, <laughs> that, you know, that, that has, was, uh, you know, particularly in, in cities like London, you know, was laid out hundreds of years ago. Um, and so uh, th there isn't really um, the same kind of sense of navigation by intersection that you have in the US. Um, and uh, I imagine that consequently the, um, the profile of address searches that we see on Google Maps in London, for example, are quite different from those that we would expect to see in New York or San Francisco or something like that. Um, so I can't speak specifically to you know, this particular feature request in, in a specific country. Um, if, if there are countries where this sort of uh, technique, if you like, for, uh, for referring to a location is common, and the, the, and the geocoding API does not support that, and then that's a very reasonable feature request, and I would, I would encourage you to put that on our, on our issue tracker, and we can pass it on to that team. Yeah. I just, um, if I could just make a comment, I just think, I think it's um, <laughs> a little pat on, on our backs here, is that <laughs> we are able to maintain this um, massive data store and also treat addresses on an individual country by country basis how they would actually be treated in in that you know we're, we're able to take advantage of our knowledge but and our infrastructure but also um, localize the product for uh, for ways in which people use mm -hmm. things like addresses in um, in different countries yeah okay so here's another one from the moderator it says uh, there are some map layers that are documented in the API and available in Google Maps, but it seems to be disabled in the API for some countries. For example, the traffic layer for Sao Paulo and Brazil. Any plans to enable it? Um, so the, in, in, any, in, in any instance where that is the case, there's almost always a, some form of licensing or contractual restriction that prevents us from offering um, that layer in, that a, in the API in that country. Um, we do not sort of deliberately withhold content from, from developers unless we have to. Um, the API is, um, is in some respects a challenging uh, concept to discuss with, say, sort of uh, the, the, the organizations that we license a lot of data from because they, many of them are nervous about the consequences of, of, of broad um, you know, free access to, this, to their data. Um, and so uh, you know, we, we work very, very hard to make uh, um, organizations where we source this data comfortable um, with this, but sometimes, um, you know, we're, we, uh, we're unable to do that uh, and, and decide that um, it would be better for us to offer that data on Google Maps um, and not in the API than not offer it at all. Um, in, in all of these cases, we, um, we always revisit this regularly with them and we talk to them about um, you know, ways in which this service is being used in other countries, ways in which developers are, are making use of these layers, point out sort of innovative things that are being done with it, um, you know, highlight the ways in which this increases the value of, 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 of the services they offer, um, and encourage them to, you know, to um, provide us with the necessary syndication rights that we need. Um, you know, but, but sometimes it, 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 uh, it's still an ongoing, an ongoing discussion. Um, so I can't give any commitments as to when we would enable a specific layer in a specific country, um, but just to say that you know every time we have to um, to restrict the API in this way, it, it sort of pains us, and it's something that we continue to try and uh, and work on and improve. Mm. And there's a lot of code that sort of handles all of this stuff. So if we didn't have to deal with that at all, it would <laughs> you know be yes. quite a relief, right? Yes. Um, uh, oh, and so the other thing I might mention is there's a spreadsheet that uh, mentions all the coverage for map data, uh, directions, traffic, and all these kind of things. Um, and I, I believe it's linked in the Maps API FAQ. That's correct. Um, so if you go over there, uh, you can you know, see, if, see if these features are available in your country. So there's, a, there's one more question that actually got posted as a comment on the Office Hours post. Um, and it says, do you think Google Maps offline is heavy and difficult to use on a, it says on a call or a smartphone? I, I think, I'm not sure what that means, but we could address the smartphone uh, issue. Sorry, so I think they're, they're, they're asking basically about performance on, uh, for offline on a, uh, on a smartphone. This is in the, in the native application? 
Uh, it's unclear what the what it's referring to. Yeah. Uh, it says Google Maps offline. So. I guess offline for the JavaScript API is is quite a technical challenge um, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the the capabilities of browsers uh, for offline caching is only coming into effect uh, relatively recently. Um, so my understanding is that the the Android Google Maps application has a labs feature that allows you to download uh, a certain amount of map data within uh, within a given area for offline use. Um, I am not aware of any specific performance issues with that, um, but it's not really my area of expertise, so I may be overlooking something. I do know, though, that um, that offline ca capabilities in that application were part of the um, uh, the presentation that was done on June 5th. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to evaluate kind of the incremental changes that have been made uh, and the improvements that have been made um, uh, that uh, you know, in relation to that announcement. Um, so I think that's that's probably just something that, uh, that we should check out um, once once that launches publicly. Yeah. It'll be so launched tomorrow, as well, I believe. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tor, I was just going to say um, we probably should close this up now since we don't have any more questions. But uh, do you, any last thoughts, uh, particularly as we're coming into I/O in a couple of weeks? Uh, I think there's there's two things. Um, the first is you know we we've talked a little bit about um, about uh, Maps API so the JavaScript Maps API v2 and the JavaScript Maps API v3 and uh, um, and about you know the the uh, uh, the migration from one to the other. Um, I think it's important to stress that uh, if you look back at at the sort of how this is how this has played out um, the Maps API v3 was initially announced at Google I.O. in 2009 and then uh, was uh, graduated from Code Labs in uh, Google I.O. in 2010, at which point the Maps API v2 was deprecated. Um, and deprecation essentially is our way of informing developers that this API is no longer under active new feature development um, and for setting a schedule for you know, over which this API will be sort of, um, you know, to, to give you the time to make these migrations uh, and to give you uh, the notice that you need um, before uh, the API is wound down. Now, uh, this means that uh, the, the Maps API v, uh, v2 is subject to the deprecation policy that was in place at the time it was deprecated, which was a three-year policy. Um, and consequently, the deprecation period for the Maps API v2 uh, ends uh, around this time next year. Uh, and so um, I suppose the, the message I want to get across is that if you've been um, if you've been waiting, essentially, to make that migration um, to see what new features uh, come to, to V3, to wait for the features that you need to do that migration, um, but essentially, you know, we have now, as far as we are concerned, completed the process of bringing the features from V3, from V2 into V3 that we feel um, had a sufficient level of adoption and usage in V2 to merit um, being included in V3. Uh, so now is the time to make that transition. Now is the time. That there's, there's no excuse, if you like, for, for holding back any longer. Um, it's important to start uh, you know, actively thinking about and working on making that transition. And uh, you know, I encourage you to, to use Stack Overflow and use the, the forums and the other support you know, channels that we have to get any help you need in making that transition. And our um, regular office hours. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, the second thing I would say is, um, you know, uh, Google I/O is, is as you say, just around the corner. It's uh, a big time of year for us. Um, you know, we've got a a lot of exciting things happening at I/O. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward. I always enjoy I/O. Um, just meeting developers face to face. Always have fascinating conversations. Um, but you know, we might have a few things up our sleeve as well. So I would just say, you know, watch this space. Will there be a one more thing? <laughs> I can possibly comment. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Tor. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thanks, Tom. Uh, no worries. Happy to be here. <laughs>